our presentation objectives include first, an introduction to AMAC and WAG, and then we'll provide an introduction to web accessibility, and then we'll review 10 tips for creating accessible course content. And at the end of the session, we'll have time for questions. So I work for AMAC Accessibility Solutions and Research Center. It's located on the Georgia Tech campus. And AMAC works with educators, also corporations and government institutions throughout the U.S. And we provide equal access to education, work, and life for individuals with disabilities. Uh, your home institution may be a member of AMAC, and there may be some services available to you to help with your web accessibility efforts. I would suggest that you contact your Disability Resource Center or ADA coordinator on your campus to find out if there are any benefits that would help you. For example, there is an accessible textbook service that may be of assistance. One of AMAC's initiatives is the Web Accessibility Group for Higher Education, and I am the coordinator and leader of WAG. We have members throughout the university system of Georgia and the U.S. We are a national group now, and our WAG provides a platform for both training and discussion regarding web accessibility compliance. So after you leave today, if you have any questions about implementing web accessibility, you are welcome to visit our website. You can join our listserv and post a question. You can attend our monthly meetings where we have trainings. Also on our website, we have recordings for past trainings. And there are other handouts and resources available on the website. And after our session today, Mark is going to send you some resource links provided throughout this session, and he'll share those with you, and you'll be able to access uh, the website and join the listserv if you're interested. So we'll begin with an introduction to web accessibility. And accessible means that a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective and equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. The person with a disability must be able to obtain the information as fully, equally, and independently as a person without a disability. This definition is from settlement agreements with the U.S. Department of Education and institutes of higher education throughout the U.S. Uh, it makes clear what is expected of us regarding content on our websites and academic courses. There are legal requirements and guidelines for accessibility, beginning with civil rights legislation. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, this covers places of public accommodation, and recent court rulings include the Internet as a place of public accommodation. And we have Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act as amended, and this requires accessibility of programs and services and activities at colleges and universities. So how do we accomplish this? By following standards and guidelines. First, we have Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act Amendments, and it covers electronic and information technology. We also have the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The acronym WCAG is pronounced WCAG, WCAG 2.0. If you are not familiar with 508 and WCAG 2.0, uh, by the end of today's session, you will have an introduction to the basic elements of implementing web accessibility because both of these are incorporated into our 10 tips. Then we also have a USG policy, and again, Mark will share the link to this policy with you. There is a document called Higher Education, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Section 508. This is the basis for requiring accessibility of our academic courses throughout USG. It really is a must read for USG personnel. It's only two pages. I think if you print, it's three pages. So this is a great document to be familiar with. So what happens if we don't comply? 
Well, first and foremost, there will be a loss of equivalent or what's called equally effective access to your website, your web-based content, and your online or academic courses for people with disabilities. Uh, students can take their academic needs and tuition dollars elsewhere. And so it's important to ensure that we know that there will be a loss of equivalent experience. There's also legal recourse. Individuals can log on to the website for the U.S. Department of Education or the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights and file a civil rights complaint against our institutions. They can also file a lawsuit in state or federal court. Um, all of this is very serious, but there are things that we can do to help ensure accessible education for our students. And this is to understand and implement the basic principles of accessible web content. And we're going to go through these basic principles in the form of 10 tips for creating accessible course content. So number one, provide an accessibility statement. The statement should be on your syllabus, your website, and your online course. And the statement says that you have followed accessibility guidelines and attempted to make your content accessible. And if it's not accessible, to contact you. This opens the door for individuals to contact you as an instructor with accessibility concerns instead of filing those online complaints. If you do receive a request for accessible information in your course, we are required to respond in a timely manner. The state ADA office has told us that's within 48 hours. So if you don't have the results or the accommodation in 48 hours, you still should ensure that you respond to the request, let the individual know you've received their request and you're investigating, and then pass this on to experts, maybe your Disability Resource Center or your Equal Opportunity Office or ADA coordinator to help you respond properly. Number two, provide semantic structure. This term may be unfamiliar, but it's actually very simple. What it means is that we need to provide underlying structure for the text in our documents, and we can accomplish this by using styles in Word or what are called tags in PDF documents or HTML or even with an HTML editor. This is very simple to do. On the screen, I have a screenshot of Word since it's very popular throughout USG. And on the menu bar, I have a circle with a line through it to no longer use a larger font size or bold or italics to emphasize text. These are visual indicators only and assistive technology will not access any structure for the document. So instead, what you'll use is the styles menu. And on the styles menu, there's a little button in that corner and when you select that button, it will expand the styles menu. And this contains everything that you need to help ensure that you create structure in your document. So how would you use this? Well, you could go to the title of your document, highlight the text, and then you select the button for heading one. And then go to every section title in your document, highlight that text, and select heading two. And then every subsection title in your document, select that text and heading three. And typically, heading one, two, and three is, is what most people will need. If you have any sub subsection titles, that would be a heading four. Then go to all the text that you would previously provide in italics, highlight that text, and this time you will use emphasis. Any text you previously provided in bold, highlight that text, and use strong. This provides underlying structure for assistive technologies, so when the text document is read aloud, it will have structure, and it will not be simply a collection of text. There will actually be structure to that text. Something that faculty love is that when you do use these styles, you can easily create a table of contents for your document. And you can do this by selecting the References tab, and then select Table of Contents, and you create it based on your Heading 2s, and then all your Heading 3s will be indented below that. As you make updates and changes to your document, you can come back to References and select Update Table, and it will automatically update your Table of Contents. 
So in addition to this being a great feature for faculty, it also assists students who have learning or cognitive disabilities because it provides an overview of all the content in your document. Number three, use true lists, true columns, and true tables. So what does this mean? Use your software's built-in functionality to create those list columns and tables. We need to avoid using spacebar or tab because again, those are only visual indicators and they don't add any structure to the underlying code in the document itself. It's very easy to do in Word. I have a screenshot here and I've highlighted a bulleted list for a list of items where the order does not matter. And then there's also a feature for numbered lists when the order of the items does matter. And then you can also go to insert to insert columns or insert to insert a table. Number four, readability. Divide large blocks of text into smaller, more manageable sections. If you have a page of text, it shouldn't be one long paragraph. It should be at least three to four separate paragraphs. And also use a sans serif font at approximately 12 points for all your electronic documents. Now sans serif font might not be a familiar term for you. It's very easy to find out if the font that you are currently using is sans serif. You can conduct an internet search for sans serif font and you will come up with a list of font that meet this requirement. The reason this is so important is because the other font, which is serif, has little curly cues on the edge of most of the fonts and when students who have low vision use screen magnifiers and magnify that font very large, that font will break apart if it's serif font. So you always want to make sure that you're using a sans serif font. If the font you're currently using is not on the list of sans serif font, you can simply select all your text and then change it to a font that is on the list for sans serif font. Number five, provide text equivalents for all your non-text content. This is accomplished by providing what's called alt text. And alt text is a clear, concise description, about 120 characters or less. This is because some assistive technologies truncate that description at 120 characters. And the text that you choose conveys the meaning or the purpose of the image, photograph, chart, or graph. This is easy to do for your images. If you have an image, right click and go to your format picture and look for alt text. It might be a drop down box or it might be a menu. And then in Microsoft Office, in the description field, you would type your clear, concise description. There's much more room than you need in this box, so just be sure that you keep your description to 120 characters or less. Number six, avoid color coding. We need to ensure that color is not the sole means of conveying information for students who have low vision or vis visual impairments or also students who are colorblind. On the screen, I have an example that was used by a faculty member in an online course. And in his course, he divided his students into two teams, a red team and a green team. And he color coded all information for the students, including office hours. So without the words red team and green team, students who have visual impairments may not know which color or which box is red or green. So simply by adding the word red team, office hours are Monday to Wednesday, 12 to 1, or green team, your office hours are Tuesday to Thursday, 3 to 4. Now you can use color. Color is perfectly okay as long as it's not the only means of conveying important information. And here, by adding the text, you've provided a secondary means. Number seven, sufficient color contrast. Ensure there is a high contrast between your foreground or your text color and your background colors. The highest offender in higher education content is PowerPoint slides. This may also be with key, Keynote if you use uh, Keynote instead. What you want to do is ensure that you use a dark background with a light text or a light background with dark text. 
Most of the built-in slide designs are not accessible. We can't and should not rely on our own visual acuity to measure if the contrast is sufficient. Instead, there are tools, and in the links that Mark sends to you after today's session, there'll be a link for what's called the Color Contrast Analyzer. It's a free tool. It works on both Mac and PC. It's keyboard accessible and mouse accessible. And the way that you use this is very simple. You could open a PowerPoint presentation, for example, and then select the eyedropper for your foreground color. And then you would hover over the color of your text. When you use the actual tool, it will magnify the text so you can click on it. And the tool will put the color in the color select box. Then select the eyedropper for your background color. Select the color of your background on your slide. Again, the tool will put that color in the color select box. And then the tool will evaluate for you and let you know if you pass the accessibility requirements. In this case, I have four check marks, so I've passed all four areas. If your colors don't pass, you'll have a red X and the word fail. And if you do receive that, to remediate, all you would need to do is select a darker background or a lighter color text or vice versa, depending on your slide design. Number eight, descriptive hyperlinks. Ensure that the link text makes sense when it's read out of context. And this is because assistive technologies will take all of the, all of the hyperlinks on a page and then provide them as a separate list outside the page contents. And so when that list is read, that list should, of links should describe the destination, if it's a web page, or the document title. So on the screen I have an example, and this says Assignment 1, Plants and Biology, Assignment 2, Don't Bug Me, Assignment 3, Household Pests. So these are descriptive hyperlinks. What would not be descriptive is if you simply had assignment, assignment, assignment for your hyperlinks, or if you had a URL, or read more, read more. Those are not descriptive when they're pulled out of context. So ensure that you use descriptive hyperlinks. Number nine, accessibility checkers. Always use your software's built-in accessibility checker and then follow those recommendations to fix any errors. If you use Microsoft Office, you select File and then Check for Issues, and there'll be an option to check accessibility, and it will run an accessibility check on your Word, uh, PowerPoint, or Excel documents. You can also conduct manual checks, and this is recommended for people who are just starting out learning how to ensure their documents are accessible. Once you conduct a few manual checks on your document, then you won't need to use the manual checklist anymore. But these are excellent checklists. The link will be provided uh, by Mark after today's session. But the checklists are available from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They're called the HHS Section 508 Checklist, and they're available for Word, PowerPoint, PDF, HTML, and multimedia. We all design our documents a little bit differently. These checklists are very thorough. And again, once you use the checklist on one or two of your documents, you'll start noticing patterns that you need to correct, and then pretty soon you won't need to use the checklist for new documents that you create. It's just a learning tool. Number 10, multimedia. If you provide audio only, maybe a podcast or an audio file of your lecture, you must provide what's called a text transcript. This is a text document of the spoken word. For individuals who cannot hear the audio, they'll be able to access the text. If you provide video only, you need to provide a document called a video description. And this is a text document, again, that provides the key visual elements in the video that are needed for comprehension of what's taking place in the video. Perhaps it's a demonstration, and you would describe that by text, and that way individuals who could not see the video would be able to access that text and have the text read aloud to them. If you provide audio and video combined, we need to provide closed captions, the text transcript, and the video description. 
This is a summary of the 10 tips that we just went through. Again, if this is all based on Section 508 and the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. From these tips, accessibility statement, adding semantic structure to your Word documents, open office or, or keynote documents, uh, provide true lists, true columns, and true tables, ensure the readability of your documents, provide text equivalents for your non-text elements, avoid color coding, and ensure sufficient color contrast and provide description, descriptive hyperlinks, and then lastly, check, check your work. All of these things are things that we can do. We learned how to create inaccessible documents. We can learn to create accessible documents as well. Regarding multimedia, this often requires that we train somebody in-house to provide the captions or the text transcripts, or you may need to outsource, and we may have some questions about more about multimedia. So I will turn this back over to questions and check this with Mark and ask if we have any questions. Um, I have a couple, um, and I'm also monitoring to see if, if folks have questions. On the color contrast, is that um, to help people with limited visual acuity, or does that somehow help the software? That is for people who may have low vision and they can't distinguish uh, the colors very well. And so by using high contrast, it ensures they can tell the difference between the text and the background. So on my slides, it's very obvious I have black text on a white background. But sometimes on PowerPoint slides, they may have a busy design on the background and then use an unusual color for the text. And there's not sufficient contrast so people won't be able to tell what the text says. So it is for visual impairments primarily. Thank you. Um, I'm continuing to monitor, but I've wondered about the financial aspect of this. Um, who pays and how much it costs? Right. I'm going to go back to my multimedia slide. Uh, this is a, a frequent question. Let me go back to it. Okay. Is that it? This one. Okay, great. So uh, this is a frequent question. Ideally the, ideally, the first thing is that when budgets are established at the beginning of a fiscal year, that whoever is in charge of the budget should have a certain line item or funding set, set aside for captioning or transcription needs. Uh, we know that often that does not happen, but ideally that's what should happen because at the end of the year, you can always spend the funding if you haven't required caption or transcription services, but it's difficult to scramble and find that fund funding later. Uh, sometimes people, if they have grant funded projects in academics, and I've worked with a number of faculty who have grant funded projects for webinar series or for multimedia presentations. And so uh, what, the, what they did was their academic dean required that all grant proposals would go through them. And they would notice that if anything had a multimedia component in the grant, they would write in a line item to cover the cost of captioning and transcription there. Uh, you can also use uh, existing captioned content. Uh, often people don't realize they might find video on lynda.com is closed captioned and provides transcripts. You might find caption content on YouTube or video. There's also a service called Films on Demand available through Galileo. Um, Mark and I talked about that the other day. They provide both closed captioning and transcripts. Uh, you would need to check the video if it's a demonstration of something. You might need to write a descriptive video uh, in case that text is not available. But Films on a Demand is also a good option. Uh, you might share the crop share the cost across your university to be sure that uh, people are not sending the same content off to be captioned, maybe develop a, a repository at your university or among your faculty groups. And lastly, there's a link on the, hand, uh, on the links that Mark is going to share afterwards, and there's a document from 3Play Media about some grants that you can apply for. So with all of these together, there should be a way to, to uh, provide the funding for that caption. Actually, we're required to, so we have to find the funding for it. Okay. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? 
Um, what about prioritizing the, uh, you know, people have a lot of stuff. How right. Do- Right. That's a great question. And that comes up frequently. Uh, actually, we had worked with a faculty member who had a thousand videos that were videos of lectures, and he wanted to post those online. And a thousand videos for one hour lectures was going to cost like over a hundred thousand dollars and we said okay wait we need to prioritize what is actually needed Uh, first based on need if you have an accommodation request from an individual then we need to make sure that that gets captioned first Uh, information that's required by students with disabilities for example if a disability resource center posts a video on youtube need to make sure that that's captioned Uh, um, any information regarding uh, job duties or adhering to policies anything mission critical uh, emergency services all of that need to make sure so that could be based on need Um, also in terms of the content itself uh, sometimes people create video where video might not have been the best format maybe text was a better format but people created video because they had a cell phone and they could quickly create video so consider the format Um, also in terms of access when was the video produced Uh, what is the most recent access to the video or the most frequently accessed Uh, What's the date of the last access or what was the lifespan of the video itself with the faculty member who had a thousand videos when he went back and checked some of them had not been accessed in over 10 years and so he said wow what if he had just randomly chosen some and sent them off he would have wasted his caption dollars so prioritizing what you're going to caption when funding is involved is important. Okay. I'll give myself back the ball. Um, do we have any more questions? Any questions from you folks? I think we do have a thank you. This is very helpful. Um, we will uh, be having another session on March 10th, the uh, implementing design and delivery standards in an ar- online program area. Um, and that's with Katie Mercer and Raleigh Way. So we encourage you to attend that. Also, this session will be, is being captured and we'll have it on our YouTube page. Um, just a second, um, can you discuss again about responding obligations, Janet? Yes, uh, yes. Um, so we are required to respond to a request within 48 hours. So say for example, you used color coding in your course and you didn't realize it and a student contacted you and said, uh, this is color coded, could you please correct it? Within 48 hours, you should respond and say, thank you for the email, I received it and we are working on it. So we do need to remediate as soon as possible because the law says at the time it was placed, either online or when the content was created, it was supposed to be accessible then. But what the state ADA coordinator has told us is we've got to respond to those requests so the individual isn't like out there just hanging on saying, where is the answer to my request? At least respond immediately. They say within 48 hours because it might come in on a Friday and you may receive the request on Monday. But respond immediately and say, thank you for bringing this to my attention.